to resume. Now, Professor Linda Bourne will have the floor. She is a professor in public health and director of the Institute of Social Marketing and of Canada in Stealing. She's going to talk about the gateway as an open door or an exit door of tobacco use in young people and vulnerable groups. She has the floor. Thank you very much, Julio. It's lovely to be here. And I'm particularly delighted that in this session we have Ricardo Polosa and Konstantinos and myself, uh, two of my favorite people to speak next to. So I'm very pleased to be here in Spain. I, in Spain, I know you have many challenges in relation to tobacco harm reduction, but on the positive side, you have seen really very substantial reductions in the number of young people who smoke in Spain. And what I'm going to try and do in this presentation is give you some of the latest evidence around vaping and young people. I don't have any Spanish data for young people and vaping because I couldn't find it, but I do have a lot of data from different countries that I'm going to take you through. So when I was preparing the slides, I tried to find a gate because it's supposed to be the gateway, but I couldn't find a gate, so this is a door, opening and closing the door. Okay, there are my declarations of interest. I don't have any. So if you read the newspapers here in Spain and across the world, uh, we know there is a huge confusion about these products. And one of the biggest sources of confusion is the fact that uh, because e-cigarettes and other nicotine-containing uh, devices have been popular, the popularity has risen since around 2010 in Europe, that we are seeing a new generation of children who are going to be addicted to nicotine and they might go on to become smokers. And you see headlines like this on a regular basis and there's been plenty of research that's conducted that suggests that that is the case. But is it the case? So I'm going to start off with data that I know some of you in this room have seen before. But uh, we've been looking at this issue very carefully in the United Kingdom. So I, I'm an author of the Public Health England reports. So I'm an author of the Royal College of Physicians reports. We have huge data sets in the UK and we're trying to track what is happening. So Anne McNeil, who some of you will know, and I and many other colleagues tried to put together all the UK surveys um, from 2016, 2015 to 2016. So I'm just going to take you through these. This is the world's largest study of young people and vaping, just data sets brought together, nothing terribly clever. The first study is all of the United Kingdom. That's a survey that we have run for Cancer Research UK since 1999. The second one is Great Britain, so that's England, Wales, and Scotland. The third one is Wales. This is a huge survey, where in the survey they have 90% of all the schools in Wales participate in the survey. Um, and then the final two are our national surveys in Scotland of 13 and 15 year olds. So just to take you through this slide, at this side you can see this is the proportion of 11 to 16 year olds who have ever tried an e-cigarette. And in most of the surveys you see reported around the world, that is the main measure. Have they ever tried a vaping device? Have they picked it up at least once? And you can see here, there's quite a lot of experimentation. So it's not unusual for young people to have tried vaping. But when you look at all 11 to 16 year olds in terms of are they using the products at least once a week, you can see that the proportions are very small. But where it's concentrated is in the teenagers who already smoke. So these are the kids who have already tried tobacco or are smoking regularly. And you can see in most, in some of the surveys, the proportion of smoking teenagers who've ever tried vaping is well over 90%. And when you look at regular use amongst teenagers who already smoke, in some of the surveys, it's around a third. So vaping, just like in adults, is very common, at least in the United Kingdom, and I suspect it would be in Spain as well, amongst teenagers who already use tobacco. But when you look at the teenagers who've never tried a tobacco cigarette. So those are the never smoking young people. The proportion who've experimented, you know, as high as 10, 12% in some surveys, but it's less than half a percent amongst the kids who've never smoked. Uh, and these data have not changed. So if you look back to 2013, 2014, 2012, and actually the data we released last week for 2018, the picture is exactly the same. Plenty of experimentation, Regular use amongst kids who already smoke, very low levels of use amongst children uh, who never smoke in terms of regular use. And I just want to pause for a second because the contrast is often with the USA. And I'm not going to run through all the US data. 
But in the US, the way they measure vaping is in two ways. Have they ever tried um, a product or have they used it in the past 30 days, which I think is a very weak measure. So I have a 13-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old son. My son had picked up one of the devices that I have in my study and used it once he, in, the, in the last month. He would be categorized as a vapor. So a lot of the figures you're seeing from um, the US are using that measure, and that is not an epidemic of vaping. It's just plenty of teenagers are trying them. I think what we know from decades of research in relation to smoking, the key thing is, are kids using these products regularly? And uh, in terms of never smokers, we're not seeing that pattern. And then people ask me, well, that just goes up to the age of 16. You know, you need to think about 17 and 18-year-olds because there might be much more trying and much more regular use in that group, but there isn't. So this is more, this is data from 2015 to 2017, smaller survey, but um, 17 and 18-year-olds just in uh, Great Britain. And you can see amongst the never smokers, ever use, there's definitely some teenagers, 17 to 18 year old who tried them. But in terms of weekly use among 17 to 18 year olds, the proportions are still tiny. So that's a consistent pattern we're seeing. We'll keep doing the research, we'll keep tracking this. So what about other countries? So that's the UK. So there are other data. Uh, frustratingly, the youth, uh, Global Youth Tobacco Survey, which occurs in many countries, including low and middle income countries around the world, has questions on e-cigarettes in their youth survey, and they have been presented at some conferences, but we still haven't got a publication on that. And to me, they reflect the patterns of use we see around the globe. What we do have, however, and that will be released soon, is one European study that included seven countries, unfortunately not Spain, although Portugal was part of the study, and they just presented their results last week at a meeting that Konstantinos and some of us were at. Um, and what they found was really very similar to what we found in the UK for these seven EU countries. Although the prevalence rates varied, um, just around just under half of young people had tried them in some countries, but the rates of regular use were very low. Um, and importantly as well, many of the young people reported that they were using a vaping device without nicotine. And in the US survey, uh, Monitoring the Future, when you ask teenagers, are you using a product that contains nicotine, only one in four of them in that survey reported that the device they'd picked up and tried contained nicotine. Now, they might not know and they might not report that accurately. But again, I think a lot of the concern around nicotine use in youth, we don't actually know if all young people are using a device that contains nicotine. And certainly in this, what looks to me like a very useful European survey, that is the pattern. And then finally, in Portugal, in Ireland, and the other countries where they did this uh, research in Finland, most of the users had started smoking before they tried a cigarette, an e-cigarette. So those are the European picture. And just to give you a more specific example, this is the DEBRA study in Germany uh, led by Daniel Kotz, which was modeled on the smoking toolkit study in England, the same types of questions. And you can see in relation to current use of e-cigarettes, um, previous use of e-cigarettes and never use of e-cigarettes. Again, amongst the teenagers who've never smoked tobacco, you can see that the current use of e-cigarettes is very low. So that's another country example that shows the same kind of pattern. So uh, the, uh, the last one I just wanted to show in terms of frequently of use was very new data just released this week from New Zealand. This is honor of Morewa since she's here. Um, so again, New Zealand collecting data on these, these are year 10 pupils, so they're 14 and 15. Um, and you can see again, amongst the never smoking teenagers in New Zealand, um, the rates of uh, regular use of e-cigarettes, daily use in this case, were very low. So again, it's the smokers who seem to be vaping as well. So that raises questions about are young people using them to quit smoking? Might they use them to quit smoking or are they just using them as dual users with tobacco? So that's the pattern of prevalence, which I hope was fairly clear. And I'm relatively, I'm very confident about these data because we look at them so carefully. But then the next question is, well, okay, if somebody's a teenager and they start using something, doesn't matter whether it's cannabis, alcohol, whatever, it might be experimentation, then it might change through time. So what happens when you look at the longitudinal studies that have tried to follow young people up? So we have two of these from the UK and there are 11 from the US. And basically what these studies do is they, survey young people in one school year, perhaps when they're 14, potentially thousands of them, and then they follow up the same young people uh, one year later. 
And what they found in some of those studies, and these studies in the US and the UK, is that some, people who, young, some young, people, young people who had never smoked reported at the first time point that they tried an e-cigarette. And then when they looked at them one year later, some of those children or young people had gone on to try a tobacco cigarette. And then they do statistical modeling to try and control for, do their parents smoke, do their friends smoke, have they drunk alcohol, other um, factors. And they've tried to suggest that there is a causal association between trying an e-cigarette and trying smoking one year later. But if you look at the methods they use, as is the case with any um, surveys, even longitudinal surveys, they can't establish whether the vaping caused the smoking or whether it was something else. And I think, certainly in the literature, there's a very strong suggestion that there's this idea of common liability. So some people, it doesn't matter if it's me or you or whoever or a teenager, some of us are more likely to take risks and try new things than other people. And it might be that those teenagers are the ones who are more likely both to try vaping and to try smoking. And some of them eventually, if they're vaping, may move away from smoking. So this is just an example of one of the studies from the UK. So you can see here, um, this is the e-cigarette use um, at baseline and then following them up a year later. And you can see people who said, I've used an e-cigarette weekly, they were more likely, a lot more likely to go on to say that they'd used um, tobacco when they were followed up one year later. And this is a very consistent pattern that you see in the studies. And these studies are the reason why in the US, the very large National Academies of Engineering, Science and Medicine produced a huge report that said they were very confident that there was conclusive evidence that e-cigarettes were a gateway to smoking. And that is the narrative that is driving a lot of the changes in the US. And unfortunately, because the US is so large and because they house so much of the world's media, they drive the perceptions in many countries. Um, but I don't think that we can be confident that these kinds of studies produce any evidence of causality. <coughs> now, in contrast, my colleagues at King's College tried to look at whether there was a late relationship the other way. So if you have a young person who is smoking, they then start vaping, might they then stop smoking? And you do some, see in some of the studies that that is happening. So these products are a route out of smoking for some young people, along with many other factors. And we've done a lot of qualitative research with young people around their perceptions of these devices. And I don't know how many of you talk to teenagers, but they see them as totally different. Smoking is a completely different behavior from vaping. Maybe they've seen people vaping, their friends might be vaping, their parents might be vaping. The products they're using look nothing like a cigarette. Um, the characteristics around the flavors and other features are nothing like a cigarette. And they often see cigarettes as something that older people use, and often they see vaping as something that's being used for people to stop smoking or just to try. So I think that this idea that young people are stupid and they see them the same is really uh, misguided. So I just want to show you some results which I also presented in the, la in the meeting in Munich for the first time uh, two weeks ago around a study we've been doing in the UK to look at the impact of the European Tobacco Products Directive on the market in the UK and particularly on the impact on young people. So we have, this is a large study, it's going to continue for another few years. It's funded by our big national health funder who's uh, been funding a lot of research on vaping now. So we are doing a natural experiment which looks at trends in use in relation to young people and trajectories over time. And we're also doing a lot of qualitative work which I'm not going to present today. So just to briefly tell you what we did. So we looked at surveys over a long period, from 1998 to 2015, and we looked at surveys from, from England, from Wales, and from Scotland, so three parts of the United Kingdom. Um, we had very similar questions in these surveys, so our primary outcomes were whether young people had ever smoked and whether they were a weekly smoker, and then importantly, their views on smoking. So did they think that smoking was acceptable? Was it okay for somebody to try smoking or to be a regular smoker? And then we used an interrupted time series design to essentially look for when e-cigarettes came on the market, were there any changes in the trend after that point? So this just shows you roughly what the methods try to achieve. So you can see here the data starts in 1998, it goes to 2015, and where we find that rates of e-cigarette use really start to rise in the UK is from 2010. 
So that's the cutoff year. Now we've used methods like this, for example, to look at the impact on smoke-free laws of, uh, you know, banning smoking indoors on heart attacks. A time series analysis is very a commonly used approach. So in theory, the trend could go one of several ways. It could be steady, so it could continue on a downward trajectory for young people's smoking rates. It could go up slightly because of vaping, or it could decline at a more rapid rate. And those are our sort of three hypotheses. So what did we find? So this is the rate of ever smoking in uh, young people in Great Britain from 1998 to 2015. And you can see that the decline, so the top line is the 15-year-olds and the bottom line is the 13-year-olds. So there's no change in the rate of decline for ever smoking. It's, it's continued to go down and it's going down at a really encouraging rate. There's no interruption in the trend. And then secondly, we looked at weekly smoking and there we did see a slight decline or slight slowing in the decline after 2010. So the rate of decline slowed and it particularly slowed in the 13 year olds. Now we think the main reason for this is that rates of smoking in 13 year olds in the, U in the UK are at 2%. So when you've got tiny numbers of kids smoking, it's actually quite difficult to show that a trend continues at that rate. It's what we call a floor effect. So the effect of having too few data points and, and too little data. So slight, slight slowing there. But crucially for me, so a lot of the narrative, the discussion is around young people, seeing people vaping, they'll think that smoking is okay. But when you look at the smoking normalization question, so do young people think that smoking is acceptable? There's actually an increased rate of decline in the percentage of young people saying that smoking is okay. So it's going down at a more rapid rate than it was before 2010. So that means that now, in a period where e-cigarettes are very common in the UK, we have over 3 million vapors, we have a very pro-harm reduction environment, as you all know, um, young people in the UK today are less likely to think that smoking is acceptable. So smoking has not, vaping has not renormalized smoking in the views of our young people. Um, and I think this is important. It's a soft measure, but it's important. So just to summarize, Certainly in our country, and I'd be pretty confident that in other places, certainly in Europe, this would be the case, there's no evidence that the growing prevalence of e-cigarettes has led to increased experimentation with smoking in young people in the UK. There's some evidence that young people's perceptions against smoking as normal have actually hardened rather than softened. And although the decline in weekly smoking in teenagers has slowed down, we think it's primarily because there's too few of them. And while the idea that e-cigarettes renormalize smoking has been very central to the policy debate, um, our findings indicate there's no reason to believe that that's happening at the moment. So I just wanted to finish with a final thought about regulation. Now, I know the European Tobacco Products Directive is very controversial, and we talked about the nicotine content earlier, and there's shed loads of stuff in that legislation which is not positive. However, I do believe that the measures for youth that countries have introduced probably have been useful at least to point to other people that we have protection in place. So the first thing is we have an age of sale, as you know, in most parts of the Europe, now of 18. Now, kids will still get hold of the products, but at least it's there. And secondly, um, we've banned most forms of marketing, as you know. So there's no broadcast media advertising in Europe. Um, there's no internet advertising now in the UK. Uh, there's no print advertising in the UK. We still have the billboards, but that's about it. Now, you can say that doesn't allow adult vapors to get the information that they need. But I think that restricting the marketing probably has had an impact on young people's perceptions. And it certainly is useful in terms of saying that uh, these products are not targeted at youth. And the difference between Europe and the US is in the US, there are no restrictions on marketing. So I think in terms of the policy debates around this, we need to maybe think about what are the elements which might be helpful or might be less helpful in terms of regulation. So finally, the only thing, well, there are a number of things that continue to concern me in this space, but this is one of them. I saw the stuff that had come out from the Food and Drug Administration this week uh, about their uh, vaping epidemic in the US. And one of the things that the Americans are very concerned about is that young people believe that vaping is less harmful than smoking which kind of suggests that young people believe something that's true and that therefore that's a bad thing. So anyway, um, unfortunately these are our harm perceptions which are not going in a good direction. Now on the plus side, the proportion of young people from 2013 to 2018 who believe that vaping is more harmful than smoking is tiny. 
But if you look at the proportion of young people who think that vaping is as harmful as smoking, it's gone up from 11% to 28% no doubt driven by those media scare stories. So my two concerns about this are, the first one is, if a young person's already smoking, then they might as well stick with smoking if that's what they believe, and potentially storing up you know, the years of, of, of life's lost and also uh, chronic disease in the future if they continue to smoke. But the second thing that worries me is that they have parents and they have adults in their household who smoke. And you know, decades ago, or several dec two decades ago, I did a study which looked at could uh, children persuade their parents to stop smoking? And sure enough, actually, what your teenager says to you or your little child says to you about your smoking actually does affect some people. And that's probably a good thing. But if they're saying that they think e-cigarettes are really bad and, mum, you shouldn't be vaping because I think these things are terrible, you know, how does that fit into the family dynamic? And that may be bad news for adult smokers as well as for teenagers who might find a route out of tobacco through using these products. So just to summarize, there's some experimentation. Um, they're attracting very few young people who would never smoked into regular use. They're not undermining the long-term decline in youth smoking in the UK. And our government is very confident about this, as well as the researchers who work on this issue. Um, they're less likely to have pro-smoking beliefs than before e-cigarettes um, became popular. But as I say, the harm perceptions are a concern. And hopefully, in the future, we can try and shift some of that. Um, to make this positive contribution to tobacco harm reduction in families and communities, not just thinking about individuals. So thank you very much. Thanks to my team. Thank you. So any questions, Louise? Yeah, sure you can. Oh, okay. No, Roberta. Okay, well, Louise, you go first, and then Roberta. Sorry. Sorry. Roberta. Thank you, Linda. Um, what influence can the UK exert on the US, given that we're, we're very concerned about the FDA attitude? Uh, is there anything that the UK can do to, uh, to change minds? Well, I think we have tried a few things. So the first thing, obviously, we had a, a, a US e-cigarette summit that some of us spoke at. But I think for me, so my kind of approach to this is to work from the inside. I think you know that. Um, so we have met with NIH. We've met with FDA. Um, we, are, we are partnering with them on studies and trying to get the research community to be doing similar types of research to answer the questions that are needed. Um, so. I'm not sure we can entirely change their position, but we, we are trying. And we do have these international meetings with them. And we continually present the UK evidence. Um, and I, you know, the other difficult thing with the US is I think their tobacco control sucks, basically. You know, they haven't, they haven't removed cigarettes from the point of sale. They have tobacco marketing, which is widespread. They're not even considering standardized packaging. I mean, it's way behind where it should be. And I think, that, to be honest, that is their problem. Um, and they're not able to focus on that to the extent that they should. Yeah, just wanted to, uh, you mentioned other countries, would like to add a piece of information yeah. in the case of Mexico. Thank you. Uh, there, there, was, uh, there have been two uh, cross-sectional studies and one longitudinal studies. They are copycats of uh, studies made in the U.S. However, they failed in the sense that, uh, at least in the US, the results, whether the methodology is correct or not, they are statistically significant. But the result in Mexico was not statistically significant. <laughs> so that's why they kept it on a box. They have not used it. But we are using it. Yeah, good. And the point, uh, what our interpretation, and probably this is relevant for other markets that are not Europe or North America, but emerging markets is that it's very tightly connected with regulation. Mm -hmm. Like in Mexico and like in many other middle-income countries, uh, there, uh, it's illegal, it's forbidden, it's banned, uh, or some intermediate range situations. And this affects the, the consumers, the, the rate of consumers, also in teenagers, mm -hmm. also. Because concretely in the case of Mexico, the market of vaping is fragmentary because of the regulations. On the other hand, tobacco, cigarettes are everywhere. Like a Mexican teenager can just go to an informal market or a metro station 
and we'll get individual cigarettes, which is a form of uh, black market that is almost impossible to contain. And so the, it's availability. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, vaping is much more complicated, much more expensive. So th there are issues that, are in, that, that get into this and, and are important for, for emerging markets. Just wanted to make this comment. And I think that's such an important point, Roberta. So we have the International Tobacco Control Survey, ITC, which is active in 22 countries. And what Jeff Fong's work has shown is exactly what you say. So he did a great study that compared Australia, I'm sure Attila, Attila would have views on this, Australia, Canada, the US, um, I can't remember the fourth country, and then also looked at uh, low and middle income countries like Malaysia and other countries where the regulations were coming in and they were very strict. And you're absolutely right. So fewer adults had tried vaping. You had fewer regular vapors. The policy context matters. It has a big impact. And I'm sure you're right. It has an impact on youth as well. And so I guess what we need to do is hold up the beacons of hope. And for me, they are New Zealand and Canada. So I work with the Canadian government you know, over several years. And the fact that Canada has totally changed its position and has become really positive. And you know, my colleagues in Health Canada, they really get it now. And they didn't get it two or three years ago. So I have this hope, and I know Maria will talk about her experience. I have this hope that we can change the countries, often from working from the inside as well. But it is not easy. Um, but we have to just keep going, I think, including in Mexico, as you are. Wait, wait, please. Quick question. Uh, what, is, what is the UK delegation to the COP8 going to say? Is this being filmed? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I would say that our approach, so I have not ever been to a COP, um, but obviously I know the people well who go. Um, we, what we have tried to do consistently is again work with the countries that um, are aligned with our view on tobacco harm reduction and basically try to prevent the COP from doing much on this issue. The, the best thing is for them to, to stay away from tobacco harm reduction in many respects and focus on the priority issues like uh, taxation, smoke free, the other things that you know, many of the signatories to the FCTC have not either introduced or not implemented, like the illicit trade protocol, for example. And the problem at COP is when they get into this issue, there is chaos and the countries don't agree. And those that are in favor of strict regulation tend to be some of the loudest voices. So I think the UK, working with Canada in particular last time, but also others, have managed to push it back. So I think you will find us being a sensible voice um, and, and trying to um, make sure that COP doesn't interfere too much in this space. 